We're going to uh, start the uh, producer uh, presentation panel. Uh, before we do, I, we, I've been joined by uh, Phil Weiser, who is an, a Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, for the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, and Phil will be helping me uh, moderate uh, this uh, producer presentation. I'm going to uh, introduce the producers, uh, starting with uh, folks to my extreme left and go right down the line. Uh, before they, uh, before we begin the presentations, and hopefully I, I, I don't mispronounce anyone's name. If I do, I apologize in advance. Uh, let me start with uh, Mike. Let's see, Mike's not here, so this has been uh, right. Alden uh, Zolke. Alden Zolke uh, is from Brunswick, Nebraska. Alden and his family have been raising hogs, corn, and soybeans for the past 35 years. He's a past uh, Nebraska Pork Board president, a member of the Nebraska Environmental Quality Council. Uh, he has been serving on the school board in Plainview, Nebraska for 12 years, uh, and in the last four served as president. Alden, thank you very much for being here today. Sitting next to Alden is uh, Alan Sents. Alan and his wife own a 10,000 head capacity commercial cattle feed yard in central Kansas. Alan has been around the feed yard uh, over 40 years and involved in ownership in the last 29 years. He is a director of the United States Cattlemen's Association, a past president of Kansas Cattlemen's Association, and a member of the Organization for Competitive Markets. Alan, thank you for being here today. Uh, next to Alan is uh, someone I know uh, fairly well. Uh, Chris Peterson is from my home state, family farmer since 1974 near Clear Lake, Iowa, uh, consisting of commodity crops, hay, and is an independent hog producer. Uh, raising sustainable Berkshire hogs uh, and direct marketing to consumers in the Berkshire Gold Program. He's the current president of Iowa Farmers Union, a board member of the Iowa Center of Agricultural Health and Safety Board, Iowa Citizens Action Network, along with other boards and groups in Iowa nationally. Chris, thanks for being with us today. Uh, sitting next to, uh, to Phil is Harry Butch uh, Livermore, Livermont, excuse me, um, who is a, a Ogala, Ogallala Sioux tribal member, ranch and farms with his family on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Butch is the chairman uh, of the uh, Tribes Livestock and, uh, Livestock and Landowners Association on the reservation. He is a director uh, for the local rural electric uh, association as well as a representative on the state REA board of directors. Uh, Butch, thank you for being here. Uh, Robbie Valley, is that, did I pronounce that correct? Uh, Robbie uh, is a cow-calf producer from Hotchkiss, Colorado, has been in the cattle producer all of her life. Her family and her five other ranching families cooperatively own Homestead Meats, which sells meat directly to consumers, retailers, and restaurants. In addition, the six families own a USDA-inspected packing plant where they market their own animals and custom process for numerous other consumers in West Central Colorado. Uh, sitting next to Robbie is uh, uh, Dr. Taylor Haynes. He's a cattle rancher from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, Dr. Hay Hay Haynes, is, Haynes. Is, right? Haynes is involved in multiple beef marketing efforts, both uh, conventional as well as all-natural organic grass-fed beef. I'd also like to point out that Dr. Haynes is a urologist, so if anybody needs a quick checkup later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, in these serious uh, conversations, you've got to break them up every once in a while with levity. He's a <laughs> he's a founding board. <laughs> we're we're going to have some fun on this panel. He's <laughs> he's a founding board member and president of the Independent Cattlemen of Wyoming. Uh, he's a member of the board of directors of RCAF USA, um, and is as such is the regional director for Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado. Uh, Dr. Haynes is a lifetime member of the Wyoming Stock Growers. Uh, he also was inducted into the Multicultural Western Hol Heritage Hall of Fame in Fort Worth, Texas in August of 2007. And our last uh, presenter is Mike Harper. Uh, Mike is currently a part owner of Harper Feedlock LLC. It has been engaged in the operation since the 1970s. Harper Feedlot uh, offers custom feeding options to many producers and customers in many states across the western United States. The feedlot operation handles over 200,000 lambs per year with a one-time lot capacity of 65,000 head. He is currently the president of the Colorado Wool Growers Association and is serving on the American Lamb Council. So that uh, represents the panel that we'll be discussing uh, uh, for the next hour plus uh, uh, a variety of, of, of issues. Uh, so let me start 
Um, if I can, Alden, I'm going to start with you and I just simply ask everybody down the line the way in which you were introduced. Let me just ask a very brief question uh, of all of you to just sort of open this up. Um, over the years, uh, as I have traveled around the country, um, I have heard that there is increasing concern that there are essentially fewer buyers um, to do business with and that some uh, are saying that producers or feeders are having a hard time getting bids or contracts for their livestock. Uh, is that consistent with what you have experienced and heard? Uh, and uh, if so, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, <coughs> it's obviously changed in the last is this 30-some uh, years, you know. So it has changed quite a bit in the last 30 years, uh, and, in, and I've thought about trying to break it down in 10-year periods or something. But, I mean, obviously, as uh, economies have changed, we've had uh, bigger numbers, and we've hauled in bigger numbers. I mean, if you go back into this, when we first sell, started selling, everything went to the auction barns. And then I remember as a little boy, we dad said, well, we'll save some money. We'll load the truck, and, and uh, the, the guy will haul them to Omaha, and we'll get capture a little more dollars there. And then eventually uh, the Packers, or you know, they decided, you know, we'll put some buying stations in. So then as the industry, we hauled them all to the buying stations for a while. But the, the, the trend has been, you say, future or less people buying, but the number of people selling is what's drastically went down. Uh, some of the local hog buyers, when they started 25 years ago, had probably 400 people they called on, and uh, now it's consolidated down to some of them, maybe 10 to 12 of, of us. Now, the catch in there is I market for a lot of individual people that are still in the hog business. So the number of people that we deal with is less, but I personally deal with three different packers. When we acquired the feedlot business almost 30 years ago, we had five different packers that would routinely participate in the market each week. Currently, we have three, really two of which are active participants. We were impacted a couple of years ago by the closing of the Emporia plant uh, by Tyson. Essentially, uh, they still visit us on a weekly basis, but uh, essentially uh, took them out of the active market in terms of competing for our cattle very uh, effectively. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have on a weekly basis is to try to determine what kind of space we'll have with those other two main packers that we deal with. And from week to week, it's, it's very common for us to hear that they've already secured all but one or two days of the next week's supply. When we hear, hear that, it's kind of like putting us on notice that uh, we'd better be quick to act. Uh, we certainly are more uh, defensive in, in our uh, stance in terms of trying to sell cattle when we get that kind of information and know that the trading window, as short as it is, likely uh, pass us by in those weeks if we're, if we're not careful. Now, recently, we've had an uptrend in the market, and we've had good interest in, in participation. But there will be times, especially when there's a little pressure on the market, when the numbers swell some, that we get most concerned about having access to a market. So that's one of our biggest concerns on a weekly basis. Will we have access to uh, space the next week to move our cattle? Chris? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, this is uh, quite the interesting question. When I started farming in the 70s, I actually got established by raising and selling feeder pigs, a quick turnover of profits. And tell you what, Iowa had tens of thousands of independent hog producers. There's good demand for uh, well-raised feeder pigs. And so that market has been ruined now. It basically no longer exists. But in the butcher market in the 70s and 80s, you had multiple buyers out in the countryside. You had them calling you on days they needed hogs. And I remember times when I was planting corn or whatever, and my gosh, I don't want to really sell hogs today, you know. But then the packers start calling, and you play them against each other. And Lord and behold, it comes a time when you shut the planter off, and you make an extra 5 or $10 a hog, and you load up a load of hogs. And I tell you what. One thing we've been trying to do for years that I stand for, if we want to start to solve this problem, ban the Packers from owning livestock, period. Okay. 
supply and demand actually work. Capitalism was alive and well. Yield premiums, when I first started selling butcher hogs through the uh, 80s and, and early 90s, premiums paid good. You didn't have to haul them far. That's disappeared now with, with the concentration in the packers. The premiums are basically gone. And localized facilities and packers no longer exist. You know, you got to pay the freight if you're an independent, get these hogs to where they're going to be killed. It's not about the farmers anymore. It's about somebody else making a whole bunch of money. And it progressed to in the 90s where I had to hire a marketing firm to guarantee me shackle space to get my hogs killed. At 3,000 head of hogs sold commercially a year, I was considered one of the little guys. And then, then the ASAN hogs hit, and tens of thousands of producers were washed out of Iowa. And I say today that risk, is there too much risk for an independent producer to stay in business or a beginning farmer to risk, if the bank will even loan for it, to be an independent producer. And I don't care if you're talking hogs, cattle, or whatever. The bank's attorney are questioning giving money for independent producers because the markets have been ruined. Thank you. Okay. Harry? Good morning, everybody. Um, we in uh, uh, Western South Dakota, we uh, take uh, quite a few of our calves off the cows and sell them, and then we background a few, and uh, <clears throat> and then take them take them in. We sell ours in Phillips, South Dakota, and we don't seem to have a lot of trouble getting rid of our calves in that country. Seems like a lot of people from all over come and look for them. But we do have problems with cow buyers. I'm, I'm thinking we probably get two buyers in Phillip to, to come and buy cows. I've talked to several of my friends there in Phillip and try and talk them into being there around there all the time to maybe get into the cow buying deal. And they said there ain't no way to get, there ain't no way to get into it. Because it's it's uh, pretty well taken care of by one or two people that buy for several different places, and that's how it is. But uh, and the calves seem to be uh, going to be uh, worth a little more this fall, but uh, uh, still not sure whether it's going to be enough to pay the expenses. But uh, we just <clears throat> keep a plugging in there and just hope we can figure out uh, how to make it work. That's all I got. Thank you. Okay, Mitch. Thank you. <clears throat> Robbie, what about your experiences with uh, your co-op? In our business, where we market direct to the consumer uh, through our homestead meats, approximately a third of each of the calves that are produced by the six ranching families go through the homestead meats, the direct marketing business. Two-thirds of them go directly to feedlots and, and different feedlots uh, in Colorado and Nebraska. As I visited with the individuals that buy our calves from these six ranching families, I was told that on the average, the majority of the time, there's three to four bids on these fed cattle. If we just concentrate on our, on our homestead meats, again, we entered into this to take advantage of our premium cattle, to sell direct to the consumer, and again, take advantage of the genetic improvement that we have done across all of our herds. Uh, for not only selling direct to the consumer, but the improved genetics to sell to the feedlots. Okay. We're a cow-calf producer as well, uh, certified organic grass-fed. We got into the niche because of the squeeze on the commodity side. And the niche handles our yearling cattle. We both direct market and we also deal with the major wholesale purveyors. And we've seen a tremendous contraction when Whole Foods Market was allowed to buy wild oats. And this contraction has given them such power that they will walk on a contract on the day you're supposed to deliver the cattle. So they walk on you, the feeder, or whatever, 
And by the time you figure, well, we can enforce the contract, you spent more than the margin you were going to make, so you go somewhere else. On the commodity side, for my whey cattle and my other products, we've seen a tremendous loss of buyers. Some of you that maybe flew into Denver and drove up here can see the result of that. There's a lot of little family feedlots, a few along I-25 that you could see. Well, they're empty. Well, if you got off the freeway, you could find between here and the next major freeway and the next major highway, maybe you could see 30, 50, 75, depending on which way you went. They're all empty, too. And it's consolidation and loss of access to the wholesale market that has driven them out of business. We also have another issue, and that's access to the retail market. There's not a USDA-inspected plan in Wyoming, and I've had several people try. I have no idea why, but that's an issue that should be addressed. So to give us access to the market, to decentralize meatpacking is a real key. We need to do that. There's several ways to do it. One, the HACCP rule actually has killed small meat packers. You got Fox watching the hen house and it's a paper chase. We need point sauce. <laughs> you need point source interdiction and discovery and you need to enforce the food safety rule where the contamination occurs, which is largely on the kill floor. So this, how would this solve the consolidation problem? Well, if we can bring the small, medium-sized meat packers back, then that brings the small, medium-sized family feeder back. Then the second part of this access is retail. The major wholesalers threaten, at least in Wyoming, threaten supermarkets. In my organization, which my statewide organization, in which our main goal is to increase the bottom line for our members, We've put together, say, steak specials, ground beef specials for various supermarkets, and they're happy to have that as something different to offer. Well, their major supplier will threaten the rest of their product. We won't supply your chicken, pork, etc., if you buy any beef from these guys. So that is an abusive practice that just simply needs to be regulated away, and we can compete on the shelf side by side. So really, access to both the retail wholesale market. It's what's killing the cattle industry. And we can bring that back. You know, we broke up Ma Bell, and that took a lot of regulation. If we facilitate competition with the small meat packers, small family feedlots, market access, then I think we'll break them up with competition. Thank you. Mike? I feel pretty fortunate. Uh, I would say if Colorado might be the last place we have lambs in this country, and fortunately we have two packers right now, uh, one in JBS Greeley and one in uh, Denver in Superior Packing. So I have had an access to those markets pretty regular. We have contracts with both of those entities and supply them with lambs year-round. Uh, up until the last, oh, I guess it's been about uh, six months now, I have never seen so much demand for lamb, and we are extremely short of supply, and I could sell lambs all over the country if, I, if, if there's somebody calling. I mean, we'd have that opportunity, but I don't have the numbers. Worst thing we have right now is a lack of numbers, and uh, we've got to figure out somehow to build numbers back and try to, in, try to increase uh, interest in young people and get things rolling again. So I, I want to first say, on behalf of the Justice Department, how glad we are to have a partner in Secretary Vilsack. The leadership you have given and focus on this issue has made this partnership possible. Second, for those who aren't going to be able to speak publicly for uh, any fears of intimidation, harassment, or concerns, I want to acknowledge two people. Uh, Bill Stallings, who is uh, going to be up here shortly to listen to folks. Um, is a, a leader in our agriculture section, and Norm Thamelant, who's also up here, uh, a, a leader, uh, agriculture economist. These two individuals are here in part to talk to people informally, because part of the effort to gather ideas, concerns, we know it's going to happen not only people speaking publicly, but people speaking privately. So we would encourage anyone who has those interests, myself obviously, as well as both Bill and Norm are here for that. With respect to questions, I want to go back to the side of the table because there is a theme that I, I saw developing about potential opportunities and constraints on those opportunities. Um, one thing that uh, 
I think Taylor mentioned, which is important, is uh, the concerns about the impact of the Wild Oats Whole Foods merger and on the retail side. I want to start by talking a little bit about the retail side here. Uh, in particular, if you have concerns about mergers after they've happened, that's also information that's very valuable to share uh, and, and feeds into this project. So any of you who have seen a merger and then have felt the effects afterwards, I'd encourage you to share that information as well so that there's an ability of the antitrust enforcement authorities to evaluate what happened after the fact. That can be as or more important sometimes um, because it enables us to do better the next time and, and potentially even uh, address it. So I, I want to focus on that issue. Um, have you guys felt on the retail side any of the changes? Uh, you spoke generally and specifically in that merger, Taylor. I'll start with you. Can you explain just a little bit about, a little more detail about exactly how you see that? Is it, is it merely on this, you know, they will walk away from contracts or does it go further than that as well? It goes further than that, it goes farther than that in our area because uh, Whole Foods was a is a major purveyor and so they're also a major buyer. And what they've gone to is they buy a little local and then they import quite a lot from Uruguay. So we're seeing that a great deal. The other issue in Wyoming, without a USDA inspected plant, then obviously I can't have a USDA organic plant. So I have to transport to Colorado to process my product. And then it could be 500 miles to western Wyoming or, or somewhere else in Wyoming to sell that product. So what we're seeing with retail is obviously shelf space for the walk-in trade, but also access to packing at a reasonable price so that we can can manage our niche and stay in the black. It's, it's quite a trick. So I think mergers have to be considered very, very carefully up front. And we all protested. However, there's enough, I suppose there were enough small organic retailers, but you see they're nationwide. They're in California, maybe in Phoenix, but that doesn't help in any particular region where you got a major player that's dominant. Robbie, I want to go to you. You've managed to come up with a uh, cooperative solution. Um, do you think the model you've been able to do will work elsewhere, say in Wyoming or other places where people are, are feeling squeezed? Well, I'm thinking that we'll be glad to process your animals. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Again, uh, the six ranching families went together formed the cooperative to market beef direct because of the premium cattle that they had been producing, purchased the USDA packing facility, and our direct marketing. My concern uh, is, though, when you read the proposed rules as written now, because it bans the packer-to-packer -packer sales and their subsidiaries, we are a packer. And it does limit our marketing options as the six ranching families. So that's my concern. Again, that vagueness in that, was that in t the intent? I'm sure not. But that is one of those unintended consequences as you read the proposed rule, is that banning those sales really limits our options. We were innovative. The six ranching families took market risk. Uh, and now we'll have some of their alternatives limited. And that is a restriction on trade, and that's my concern with some of the vagueness in the proposed rule changes. C can I just comment on uh, – uh, um, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the substance of what Robbie said because it wouldn't be appropriate uh, since the comment period is still open on those rules. Uh, but I do want folks to know uh, and appreciate that Comments like that that are directed to the rules will be incorporated into the official record uh, of the comment period uh, so that anybody who makes comments, w we will incorporate that in the official record and treat that as part of the comment period uh, comments uh, so that everyone can feel free to, to, to opine as they wish, but we won't be able to respond because the comment period is still, uh, still open. I want to jump back. Mike, you, you – uh, didn't identify the concerns about the retail side uh, or even access to a sort of packing facility, uh, USDA inspected plant. Um, are, are those concerns at all for you? Could you see those becoming concerns? Maybe you could elaborate a little bit because uh, obviously you're in a, a segment that right now you have uh, the benefit of a lot of demand for your product. But are those things you're thinking about? You know, in times when we had a lot more lambs available to us, yeah, you were always – if you felt the market was suppressed for some reason, you were always looking for an outlet or an option, whatever you could do to maximize your return. 
And recently we haven't seen that. The numbers, the numbers just aren't there in the sheep industry anymore. We just continue to lose infrastructure. And we're at a point where uh, if things don't change, we're probably going to lose another packer in the industry. We've got way more packing capacity than we do lambs to fulfill, to, to fill that void. So it's hard to look to, to retail when you, when you haven't got the, the, the volume of lambs to, to, to build a market. Uh, and I'll go to Harry and then I'll turn it back over to the Secretary. Uh, is part of this, um, as, as I guess uh, Mike's comment could suggest, a normal ebb and flow? Or do you think there are things going on here that are deeper structural problems than that, Harry? How, how do you size it up? Well, I <coughs> there's not a question in my mind that there's something going on. Uh, but I don't understand the structure good enough to know. Uh, I'm pretty busy ranching, and <laughs> uh, I don't, there's something going on, definitely. Let me, uh, in the interest of geographic diversity here on the panel, let me turn to, to, to my left and, and talk to, to um, you fellas. I'm interested in, in my opening remarks, I made the, the reference to the fact that the spot market has contracted significantly in hog production. Uh, 1994 was 62 percent. Uh, today it's 5 percent. Uh, and, and there are some trends uh, suggesting that that may be the direction that the cattle industry is headed as well. Uh, obviously, cash markets are important. So I, I'm interested in knowing uh, whether or not you have any thoughts about uh, how pricing for livestock could occur differently, if it should, uh, and what it means to producers when the, when the spot market becomes relatively small and thin. Just whoever wants okay. to go first. Well, uh, it, seems, it seems to affect us more. I mean, the spot market, you already heard this morning that we're down to maybe 4 or 5%. Well, you know, I personally can't analyze it enough to know what that means in my pricing mechanism. All I can do is tell you what I've received the last, I've got 10 years of data here on prices, and it'll match up to USDA's pretty, uh, if you, you could get it from USDA also. Uh, the things that affect us more in pricing is obviously last year's H1N1. I mean, uh, you know, August a year ago, we, we sold hogs for $106 a head, you know, and it was just devastating to us as producers. This year, I don't have the August numbers in yet, but it look, you know, we'll be at $160 plus. Now, so I, I, ca I can't find a correlation of what you're talking, you know, that, yeah, there's not a lot of them aren't in the spot market, but why did we go up 60 some dollars a head in one year's time? And I can find different periods of uh, things that have affected the hog market that didn't have any, con we didn't have any control of. A few years ago, there was a poultry ban w with Russia and that came back to affect us directly. Uh, packing, you, you've asked about the packing, you know, the, the, the only time that that was was the 98 period when we simply had too many hogs for the ability for the packers to kill it. So that drove prices down in that period. But I, I don't have a direct answer on that. that. No? Your thoughts? Okay, I'll give you a perspective on the cattle side. Uh, just to run through a little bit the scenario we deal with each week, uh, trying to determine if we'll have access to a market or not, and then the way that sways our decision. Early in the week, we try to find, to get a feel for the capacity of the packer to, to procure cattle for the next week from our facility especially. Often I've got one of the main buyers we use that says that if we wait for the trade to develop, uh, he's going to be the last guy they call because he represents an area further away from the plant. So. Already we know we're a little bit behind uh, the rest of the pack in that regard. So as we go, uh, one of the decisions we have to make then early on is we can have access to a captive supply type arrangement of some kind. So the choice we have to make by Tuesday or Wednesday morning is do we want to be sure we move these cattle and go on a captive supply type arrangement so we will not participate in the cash market, which we have a uh, disagreement with, you know, we want to maintain an active cash market, believe in the health of, of many bidders in that process. But we have to make a decision then, are we going to very likely be able to participate in that or do we need to, to take advantage of one of these captive supply type arrangements which pushes us then out of the negotiating market. And just a little bit of the history we had there and, and the, the power and the leverage that the packer has. Some years ago, the packer offered a 
captive supply agreement with some of our competitors in the area giving them the high of the week if they would commit their entire supply of cattle to them we were closer to the packing plant at that time and those competitors and and put us at a disadvantage in some weeks they would be full at that plant mm -hmm. from these competitor cattle that were further away cost them more money to get there and overlooked us in the process so I told that buyer I said well if you're going to discriminate us against us in that way I'm going to allow the other packer buyers first opportunity to buy our cattle I thought it was turnabout fair play type of thing well the the original buyer then uh, didn't like that kind of response and told his buyer to quit coming into our yard so for three months we didn't get a representative from from that major packer into our yard just because we had tried to play ball the same way the packer was trying to deal with us a very evident sign of intimidation and why you hear these stories of why producers are afraid to stand up and try to make a stand to keep active in the cash market which we believe is the healthiest form of our business and just reaffirms the need that we have for a referee in our market and and we appreciate the effort now being made to address this issue and at the level that it is and greatly appreciate uh, Secretary Vilsack and also the Department of Justice taking that effort to do that and you've noticed some green shirts in the crowd today those are people that are recognizing and supporting GYPSA in, in addressing this issue through the rule change and that type of thing so the the effect then of our cash market ultimately is a detriment to all of us initially the Packers have picked off a few of these uh, large entities that are using supply you know one of the biggest disagreements we have is with the uh, critics of this rule change saying that it's all about uh, procuring quality cattle that has nothing to do with it the largest supply agreements have had everything to do with supply and controlling that inventory and nothing to do with quality cattle and that's been shown by numerous studies and examples Chris? Now, I'd like to go back a few years to the ASAN hogs. And when that happened, the packers and others in the in industry figured out they had enough control to force prices down. And so they flooded the market with hogs. And the result was tens of thousands of independent producers being purged out of business or going into bankruptcy or committing suicide, whatever. They were exited out of agriculture. Now, today, we have Iowa, Southern Minnesota uh, daily markets. Two to 3,000 of these hogs are you know, on the spot market. And a lot of these hogs are the poor doing hogs, the, the hogs that you know, once in a great while, the packers, they need a few pigs. And they get these hogs. Now, on the other hand, hundred thousand dollar or a hundred thousand hogs a day on the spot market half of these spot transactions are packer to packer isn't that amazing <laughs> it's like everybody's being convinced here I have really been convinced for a long time that something's going on here and the farmer pays the price I don't care if you're an independent pork producer a or a contractual pork producer because all the prices are based off the spot market, the contract. So, yeah, there's something going on here. Somebody's making a whole bunch of money, and somebody's getting screwed. I'm interested uh, in, the, in the panel's uh, discussion, uh, the, your thoughts about uh, when we talk about a spot market, is there uh, a percentage, is there a, a, an amount uh, uh, that, that you feel would be a more accurate reflection or a more appropriate reflection, number one? And number two, uh, what can we do in the, in the interest of transparency to provide more information so that whatever decisions producers are making are, are, make, are, are being made on the best available information and the most comprehensive uh, information? Mike, you want to start with that? <coughs> I'll, I'll tell you what we're doing. We're, we price our lambs on our contract basis based on the USDA market sheet Monday to Friday, Monday through Saturday every week. And I will tell you, I, I am a little frustrated. We're seeing live lamb prices, record prices all around us. And, you know, we're big boys. We sign these contracts, and they've worked for us in years past. Well, right now, they're buying lambs on the outside of, the, you know, outside the dress market at $1.40, somewhere in that range, as high as $1.45. 
and I'm sitting here looking at a dress market that's quoting me back a dollar twenty-two to twenty-five, and because my contracts, I'm I'm tied into that. Now, I don't know what's going on, but the dress market in the last four to five weeks has been changed lower every week, two to three dollars on the low, on the lighter carcasses and and small amount on the heavier carcasses. But why are we seeing lower a lower dress market and getting it quoted that way and higher live prices outside? I'm a little perplexed by that. Well, what we see in, on the cattle side is really the captive supply effect. And so you asked ask about transparency. If all contracts were reported and all prices in the market, whatever the entree into that market were reported, then we'd have more transparency. But really, to get that, you, to get a really open, robust market, you gotta, you got to get away from concentration. And it goes back... goes back to your, your question, previous question about pricing. We've seen a 13-year decline in the, in the U.S. cattle herd for a cycle which used to be, say, four to six years, and then a nervous cycle maybe would be seven years. And as you hit the bottom of that decline, the producers saw an increase in price driven by supply. Well, we're in a 13-year slide. We are seeing record supermarket prices and that gap between domestic production and uh, consumption is about two and a half billion pounds a year that's filled with imported cattle. Well, that's killing us. It's driving us out of business. So pricing is, in, depending on the time of the year some people have to sell, it's whatever they can get. It's not related to what they've got in the animal, not related to what they're worth. And they can do that because they control the supply. By controlling packing and feeding, it flows right back to the individual producer. We saw this spring, for no apparent reason, except one, a jump in calf prices and yearling prices in the late spring. And it was because, Mr. Secretary, you scheduled, you and the Department of Justice scheduled this hearing. <laughs> yeah. Not, not being clairvoyant and being Christian, I don't, I don't ever tell you what someone else's motive is. However, there was nothing in supply, nothing in demand that generated that price increase. This hearing was the only change in our life, and so I'm sure that's why the prices went up. So really it goes back to simply somehow getting rid of concentration at all levels, facilitating small independent producers at all levels. That's the cow-calf, lamb producer, hog producer, and the medium and small packing plants, that'll bring the feeders back. It'll make the food supply safer because right now it wouldn't take much to contaminate just about the whole meat supply, or 88 percent of it. <coughs> so, so repetition is the mother of retention, so the key here is to, is to decentralize the meat and food production. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Robert, do you have any comments about transparency or the spot market, given the nature of your operation? Certainly, when we look at, there's been an incredible body of, of study that has been done regarding this, uh, some of it being done by professors here at the Colorado State University, and some you will hear from later. Not only uh, 10 years ago, but recently with the RTI study. If we look at the AMAs, the alternative marking, it has added $6 per head across the board to the contracts. When you look at all of the information that is currently available on the internet regarding the grids, the superior sales that happen every week, every month, all of the internet sales, all of the information that's out there, there is a considerable body of evidence information already out there. Now, what is needed when we talk about is just what Mr. Harper alluded to. That information, some of those discrepancies, but certainly not getting into the business of private contracts that are entered into between willing seller and willing buyer 
and posting those for all to see. That is not is what is needed. Thank you. Butch? I, uh, <clears throat> I don't have any answers, but I've, I've got uh, questions. Uh, going back to this cow thing, uh, we've got <clears throat> several reasons why the cow market should be depressed right now. I mean, we've got cows coming in from Canada. Uh, we've got um, <clears throat> dairy cows being killed. Uh, and usually this time of year, our cow market is, uh, oh, mid-40s to top of mid-50s. Now, uh, <clears throat> there's, been, there's been cows selling for 70 bucks in the last month. Uh, now they're, I mean, they're still pretty much over 60. Why? I mean, uh, it's, it, it all goes back to maybe what Taylor said. Somebody up there that's buying these cows know that we're having these meetings. I want to pick up on a point that Robbie referred to and was referred to in the first panel and then coupled with another question, which is one is, how is technology and the use of uh, broadband <laughs> where it's available uh, changing the marketing and selling of uh, cattle and other livestock? And um, secondly, what uh, advice would you offer to a young person looking to become a uh, cattle farmer or a rancher? Um, maybe just uh, start at the other end of the table, um, both technology and advice to uh, young uh, ranchers. Would you say that again? Sure. I, I uh, do you sure. use? Let me ask you two questions. Do you use technology uh, a, at all to change how you operate from, let's say, 20, 30 years ago? Has that been um, something that is uh, starting to enable you to operate more effectively? Okay. Well, I'm right in the middle of uh, my three <coughs> oldest boys are uh, 26, 23, and 20, and they're all becoming uh, actively involved in the farming operation. And hands down, the, their ability to use technology. Uh, you know, I have a hard time keeping up with it. Uh, yeah, we, we do some farming on the side, you know, and their ability to use the GPS and, and those things are, are phenomenal. Uh, did you want other specifics? Or Does it affect how you sell at all, by the way? Uh, some people, have, I think, mentioned that they're actually able to use um, either value and price information or even selling directly uh, over the Internet. Is that... You see that at all? If anything, that's my expertise. That's one thing I have over those three boys yet. And, uh, yes, I use the Internet every morning. I tend to start looking at the markets. Obviously, we trade world markets, you know, just constantly. And uh, you can become totally absorbed with, it, with technology today. Uh, everybody knows that the grain, everything trades. But I can get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and, and, and you're starting gathering information then already. Uh, so, no, it's, it's constant. I mean, I, I, I probably spend two to three hours a day analyzing whether it's the grain market or, uh, you know, the flow of the hogs or who, where the demand is. Uh, no, I use it extensively. Well, certainly uh, technology has, I think, led to this narrow trading window that we have in the cattle market especially. Each week we may have uh, just as short as 10 minutes to an hour to trade our cattle. And in years past, we used to wait till we could talk to people at night uh, to get, just to get a hold of people before cell phones and that type of thing. And we'd have bids that would be good till the next morning or some extended time like that. So certainly, it's added to the pressure of doing business. Of course, uh, the information available uh, about the market and, and what's going on is, uh, is almost information overload at times, too. But, but certainly, that has led to some of these issues that we're addressing, the narrow tra trading window and those types of things, along with the decreased activity in the, in the spot market. And I'd like to respond a little bit about the spot market and, and the value of these alternative marketing agreements. And certainly, no one, and, and we especially, we've made a great investment in our facility to do sorting, to try to find a product that is desired by consumers in terms of quality, uh, avoiding overweight, uh, overfinished cattle, and those kinds of things. And we, as, men, as much as anybody, don't want to see cattle just bringing one price. And I know the proposed rules do not do that. And it's uh, extremely frustrating that many of the naysayers continue to, to, to say that this is going to eliminate those things. And we can think of nothing more unreasonable, as the language of the law indicates, than for that to happen. And I'm confident 
that it will not happen that way. But in, in terms of how to address that, and I think you'll hear some more detailed explanation this afternoon, uh, certainly the whole captive supply issue is, is something that has to be looked at. And how do we start? Maybe, maybe there needs to be a plant-by-plant plant, uh, percentage, 50%. There needs to be input on that to develop what that level is. The uh, uh, cattle that have to be procured in the spot, negotiated market. And that gets back to the information part that you're asking about, too, then. We need more information to know how many cattle are actually negotiated for versus how many earlier in the week, too. Uh, so much of this is after the fact that we get that information. If we could get that sooner in the week because it impacts our decisions that week, uh, to know better what we're looking at in terms of what is available in the, in the nego negotiated market. And those are some of the key things that I think uh, we need. And there is great premiums out there, and we have customers that have focused on identifying those premiums, and they know that the market generates them if, if we have access to it. So, again, market access is, is the key question we have. And for the young people starting today, I think it's important, first of all, they get the education to use the technology to be able to address the issues but also then that they're involved in these kinds of discussions too to shape the policy that we have that's going to impact the likelihood of our rural economies to continue, the likelihood that they can come back. And, and there is value, uh, economic value, in having 10, 10,000 head feed yards distributed across our rural economy versus concentrating just for market power alone into 100,000 head feed yards. So. Yeah, I uh, access technology on a, on a daily basis. Um, you know, I'm proud to say I sell a lot of stuff, uh, you know, through the Internet, um, word of mouth, whatever. I sell local first, take care of my customers, and then I sell in the Berkshire Go. I'm proud to say, unfortunately, that today I don't want sell one hog to a packer. I gave up on him. I got screwed over too many times. And technology, yes. Again, I use it, but I'm busy farming and, you know, a couple off-farm jobs or whatever. And I guess my response is you can't depend on it, and it's not the answer to correct the problem here. We all know what the problems are. Every farmer and rancher setting out in the audience. I just want to bring up one more thing. Oh, technology evidently has been very successful for the Packers. I think we all realize that. Um... One other thing I want to bring up, a good friend of mine, John Crabtree of the Center of Rural Affairs, him and I have known each other for years, done a lot of work together. Um, there's some rural making going on, and here's what's going on. The, the packers routinely pay five to six cents more per pound or more in volume-based premiums to the largest hog producers simply because they are large. Six cents may not sound like much of a discount. But I tell you what, for an independent producer, a guy with 150 sows, fail to finish operation, trying to market on a yearly basis, that equals $56,000 of income. That's an off-farm job. We don't need the whole slice of pie. We just need fairness and equality. And this is very, very important. If we want to get the age of the farmer and rancher down to where they're farming 20 and 30 and 40 years and not 10 more years. Thank you. I, I'm interested in this, uh, this issue of, of access. Uh, it, you all have mentioned it uh, at one time or another in, in your comments, either uh, having concerns about it or, or being able to, uh, to, meet, to, to meet the needs. Tell me a little bit about what you think USDA ought to be doing with its rural development programs to, uh, to address this issue. Well, what could we do if, uh, in, in terms of creating more opportunities for, uh, for more markets? And, and how could we do it in a way that would be uh, th that would uh, allow someone to make a decent living by operating one of these facilities. I guess, <clears throat> I guess to stimulate young people, like we've all talked about, it needs to be more profitable. L low interest loans or, or something to that degree is all I could think of to, to get somebody in. But it's not easy to get in anymore. Property values are extremely high. The cost of our livestock right now are, are and on the sheep side are extremely high. 
So you're talking about a, you know a young person just off you know I don't want to say off the farm. Most of the young people in our industry have have uh, inherited it, grown up in it. It's a family operation. If they choose to continue to stay, they continue on that way, and they've got some resources well, there. But my question is, if you have to travel 100 miles or 200 miles or 500 miles to basically sell your livestock, how could USDA provide a closer market? Are there things that we should be doing that we're not doing, things that would be able to be helpful? I, I, did, I don't know that I can answer that. Well, we certainly... Uh, back to something I mentioned earlier, Mr. Secretary. If, if the rules for the state inspected plants are released, then I would suggest that the USDA do that so a state inspected plant that meets all the standards can ship nationwide. That takes that back to local. <laughs> then you could take your present cadre of USDA inspectors without having to hire more and let them randomly inspect to be sure these needs are met. See, the states would have to maintain the standards, but you can randomly inspect to be sure that's being done with your present cadre of USDA inspectors, and that would free up local trade. That's not an overnight thing, but the small packing plants coming back will bring the small feeders back, will bring meat production and sales down to a local level. You mentioned technology earlier, earlier. The video has actually exacerbated concentration because they can get more cattle in one shot. And the fact that you maybe get a nickel more or a nickel less, the problem is you're not dictating the price based on what it costs you to produce the animal. The only way to do that is direct retail sales. And the only way really for most of the people in this room, whatever their product is, to have local retail sales or at least regional retail sales is local and regional packing plants that cater to the small and medium-sized producer. We still have to solve the shelf space problem, but I think we can do that in a cooperative way. I think we can do that by having our individual states regulate fair trade and, and monopolistic activity. So I don't think USDA has to do everything, but I think to... to allow us at least the infrastructure, which is what I consider me as a producer and the meat packer and the small family feeder is really the infrastructure in, in supplying red meat and, and fiber to the nation. So the USDA has a role in that. The retail part of that, the supermarket part of that, I think that goes back to the states. And we should, as producers and taxpayers and voters, we should be able to deal with that on a local level. Robbie, you, you, you basically can uh, tell us a little bit about the economics of this, but what, what would it take uh, if you were starting from scratch to do what you, to replicate what you're now doing with your operation? What would it take? H how could, how could a, a, a USDA be helpful uh, apart from uh, inspection issues that, that were raised from a financial perspective? Again, uh, when we uh, purchased the plant there, it took significant upgrades to uh, make it so that it was, uh, that it did pass all of the USDA inspections. Uh, and we are, we will average two to sometimes even as many f as four, but the majority of the time there's two inspectors in there full time. Uh, we welcome that, we use that as a marketing uh, tool to show that uh, there, is, there is that oversight for not only the food safety, but uh, for marketing in general, we use that. One thing that, uh, in, if we talk about rural development and we talk about what can be done for the, the young people, there are, we, we have received a value-based uh, marketing be, to uh, expand our market into ready-to-eat entrees, and we did receive a, a USDA rural development grant to do that. But that limitation on rural development where you cannot uh, build infrastructure purchase equipment under uh, rural development really hinders. You can study something till you're blue in the face, but if you can't implement uh, the results of your study, meaning you can't purchase that $30,000 piece of equipment without a significant uh, rigmarole, uh, that's where if there was a, a lower base there that would be easier to work with, that would truly help 
uh, from the rural development side. Now there are programs where you can purchase equipment. I certainly understand that. We've looked into that over and over. But is that onerous regulation? Again, we cannot overregulate the marketplace that really causes us trouble when we try to implement some of our uh, development grants. Let, let me be clear about this in terms of regulations. Are you talking about the application process? Or are you talking about some restriction in terms of geography? It, we're talking about the restriction on what you can use those dollars for. So flexibility in terms of the dollars. Correct. Okay. Any other panelists want to weigh in on that? Well, certainly, you know, the programs that provide low interest loans for beginning farmers and, and ranchers, I think, are, are, you know, serve a good purpose that way to encourage that type of thing. And, and the whole issue on the uh, uh, to address uh, the efficiency that is needed to operate some of these different packing plants and that type of thing, you know, just continued, continued research in some of those areas that uh, uh, might uh, benefit smaller operations to succeed uh, economically. But I think also just enforcing the laws that we have uh, will do much to keep a diversified, uh, efficient, operation size, and, and the GYPSA is attempting to do that now. You know, another area that's going to have to be addressed is, is this, this whole market power thing just gets passed down the chain. We have to have it addressed at the retail level to address what the packers, you know, face in their operations, which is passed down to us then, and, and somehow get a handle on, on this distinction between market power size for that versus the economy of size efficiencies, and we've, we've just shifted and went beyond efficiencies to just accumulating market power. I'd like to address the, sure. the young people side. I, um, I deal with young people in our area on a daily basis, and there are five young producers, ranching, again, families that have come back in the last three years. They want to be part of the infrastructure. They are... Uh, struggle with, just as mentioned earlier, the access to capital, the access to, to operating, especially now with the ever-increasing uh, regulation when it comes to operating capital. So there is that willing desire to come back. But it's the overall picture. Uh, we use the Internet very well to market our product, to tell our story. We are all cattle producers, and we all have a quality product and we have people that are external to this industry that are trying to say that we are bad and that we are bad people and that we treat our animals bad. That's how you can effectively use that internet to tell your story. Again, we are all cattle producers. But when we work with young people, again, on a daily basis, they're concerned <laughs> about what is the sage grouse issues, endangered species going to do? What about the estate tax? What is that going to be? What about the clean water? What about dust? All of those things. Again, it's that increasing regulation that as we sit down with young people, we really have to take the big picture. There are so many external people out there that want us out. We should not be circling the wagons and shooting inward. Mr. Secretary, that brings up a good point, that if I could mention one thing. We've got, uh, recently there was a decision made on the Payette National Forest in Idaho. We're going to lose potentially five ranching families in the sheep business. Uh, one of the largest producers in the United States is, is greatly affected. And, uh, you know, you talk about encouraging and trying to get people to stay in. There's his younger brother's got three young children. And he's excited about the business, and now he's been kicked off the Payette Forest because of the bighorns. And there's been, I think the Carlson family is one family up in that area that's been there since 1928. And they've lived there with bighorns the entire time, and there's still been no significant proof that disease is communicated back and forth between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep. But the easy, quick fix is to just oust the rancher, and off he goes. And it affects... It affects my market because we buy lambs from them and we, we feed them and we, we provide that product to the public. Yeah, I, uh, as far as uh, rural development, you know, there's been a lot of money invested in rural America and I'm sure that will continue. But we need to invest in our main streets and infrastructure that 
quite frankly, in this day and age, promotes and forces more localized agriculture. <coughs> okay? The state of Iowa invested in Supreme Pack in northwest Iowa. Uh, that's where some of the Nyman Ranch hogs go, and that's where the, some of the Berkshire Gold hogs go. It's providing a service to small independent producers. And, you know, the last thing I want to see is, in backing up a minute, we need to evaluate who's going to benefit first from rural development funds. You know, I see a lot of bad things going on. I see some bad, good things going on. The last thing I want to see is guaranteed loans put out there by the feds and the taxpayers to, ver to back up vertically integrated packing facilities. Alton, do you have a point? Yeah, again, I'm just speaking from experience. My second son is actually using uh, equip funding, and that's been a very, uh, the oldest son used it also, and, and I've used it in the past. That's been very good for us. Uh, He's also, the second one's also looking into the uh, young farmer ownership, you know, and, and, and there's obviously a lot of requirements, and he has the ability to do the paperwork to get it done. So we will get it accomplished, but, you know, I, I do want to make light of the fact that one thing that the, uh, they are requiring is that he has a three-year contract uh, to sell his hogs, you know, to somebody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the contracts are very important for, for these young people. That's the only way the bankers are going to let them secure these loans. Yep. So a question that has been diverted to, I want to pick up on it, is uh, premium or niche offerings that give people a differentiated product. Um, how significant is that and, and how real is that opportunity? Um, I think a couple people have mentioned it. Um, uh, Taylor, you, you mentioned that in your case and Robbie as well. Why don't you start and then others? That's niches two tiers for us. Uh, certified grass-fed organic, obviously retail is where the greatest yield is. And retail, retail can be six, seven fold over, over what commodity price is. But in my wholesale side, we run about 30 percent, we'll average about 30 percent higher prices than the retail market. But everything that happens on the commodity side for fed cattle affects us because if we don't take a contract, if we don't cut a deal with a major purveyor, then the only place we can go is the commodity side. So they use that against us too. But it, all, but it does provide us some margin and some cushion to be certified organic. And it, there are a fair number of hoops to jump through, so it's, a, it's not just something you do. It's a way of life and it's a mindset. But it's not hard to do. It's not rocket science at all. For young people, my son, I'm the fourth generation in ag, production ag, since uh, slavery continuously, and my son is the fifth. And for him, the fact that we're certified organic, and he is an excellent marketer, we do internet sales as well, that really is the thing that allows him to come in and have a future in the business. Robbie? Value-based marketing has, has given our family and our direct marketing business the opportunity to compete uh, at the highest level. But even before we started Homestead Meets, Again, those value-based marketing where we had that uh, relationship with the individual that provided the feedback that uh, gave us the information to improve the quality of our cattle. And when we improved the quality of our cattle, then we had a significant increase in the choice grade. When we had the significant increase in the choice grade in our cattle, then there was an increase in that subsequent price receipt for the cattle. That's value-based marketing. And that was... Uh, the only way that we, as someone who's in that 300 to 500 head range, can actually take advantage of that quality and compete is having that quality-based uh, contractual agreement that rewards quality. Mike, did you want to? Did you want to? No. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd just say we've seen a great benefit. Uh, we are a CAB licensed feed yard certified Angus beef. And since beginning that about 12 years ago, we've made improvements in our facility, also in training of our people, and also then the quality of cattle that we've handled. And a lot of that's been the information we've provided back to the rancher to make the improvements that have been mentioned. So we've been real active in that process. And the neat thing about that, you know, there's some of these niche programs that are great for the people involved in them. But in terms of, of the volume of, of premiums available, they rest in the USDA identified grades, prime, choice, certified Angus beef, 
that are available to anybody. Those premiums are determined in an, in an openly negotiated marketplace. It doesn't take specialized deals to get access to those things. And those are premiums that are determined in the marketplace, and, and we have found great value in them and appreciate that and know that they will be continued uh, even under you know, updated rule changes and that type of thing. So we have, have found great value in them and certainly look forward to being able to capture that in the future and, and know that that will happen. Well, the, the number one thing about, you know, the niche markets, there's, there's good profits in it. And, you know, the Berkshire program, I sell private and into the Berkshire Gold, the profits are basically a third to double, you know, the price you're getting for your livestock. And we got to get smarter in the 21st century here with food. And I'm talking food miles. You know, food travels on average, every bite you take, 1,500 miles in this country. And in the time of us trying to deal with energy costs, we got to rethink the whole structure of agriculture here. There's things we need to promote more than others. There's other things we need to discourage. And my product. I'm a firm believer, you know, it's safer to eat. Uh, quality control is great because I eat it too. <laughs> and I don't use the antibiotics and, the, you know, the quality is there. And that's the wonderful thing we used to have in this country 20 and 30 years ago was a more localized, regionalized food system. It worked. It worked. We fed this country for decades. It worked. And my personal opinion is that, you know, letting this consolidation and, and concentration get out of hand has contributed to the public health crisis in this country and has contributed to the food safety problems in this country. And, you know, I'm from Iowa. You all have been reading about the egg recalls and the concentration in the egg industry. I hope I made my point. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Vilsack, yes. um, I, uh, I think this, this niche, uh, these niche markets are good, uh, but I'm thinking we probably can't all get into niche markets. Uh, you mentioned... Uh, uh, what what you could do to get uh, maybe the market closer? Well, I don't have a problem with hauling my cattle to a market to get price discovery. I mean, that's that's where we find out what our cattle are worth, and to you know just let everybody bid on them that wants to. Well, the problem we've got is uh, is getting our fair share of them that the packer allows us to have. As it looks to me like, yeah. and uh, um, <clears throat> I, I, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of the big thing of keeping these young folks in business is being able to get their fair share. If I could follow up on that point, Her you and Taylor said something. Uh, how far is too far in terms of to have to haul your cattle? When does it become cost prohibitive? Either hey, uh, either you can jump on that point. It's a good question. I, I, uh, we're uh, we're lucky in Western South Dakota. We've got markets everywhere. I mean, we've we've got markets within uh, 50 miles of us, and some people would rather go 100. I mean, that's just their preference. Anything over <coughs> anything over 100 miles, I ship it uh, frozen, cut, and wrapped. And live cattle, I try and keep it under 100 miles, and I like to rest them once they get there, at least a day or two before they uh, are sold. Yeah, it's a bigger issue the bigger the animal, I think. So for the finished cattle especially, uh, we find once we go, it's about 180 miles to uh, the furthest plate plant in the, in the state for us, and once we go beyond that, we begin to see bigger issues in terms of shrink and dressing percentage loss and that type of thing. So. Certainly, they travel further, but uh, we find that to be a kind of a workable business. Yeah, the, the way it used to be compared to the way it is today in the last few years is when I first started raising hogs, you know, you haul them 10 miles down the road and they get weighed up and you get a price. And 
you know, it got to be where my hogs were traveling 100, 200 miles to get the market as the industry consolidated. And you're paying the freight and you're paying the shrink because them hogs are not weighed until they get to that facility. So, yeah, it's a huge uh, discrepancy in the prices you're getting. You know, I'm fortunate in northeast Nebraska. You know, we, uh, currently I think it's about 180 miles is the farthest packer, but uh, I spent s some time with some of the Montana guys, and, and obviously the, they have a challenge. I, you know, I don't remember if it was 1,800 miles. It was a tremendous haul that they have to haul. So the, their cost, you know, it, it's, it's tough. Uh, you know, t typically what happens in the hogs then is they may become the ice and wean provider, which they could haul greater quantities and then have them fed out in the Midwest, and it's... So uh, on the uh, USDA website uh, with uh, in the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Care area, there are maps of the country. We've tried to begin the process of trying to identify precisely where all the facilities are so people can visually see where the gaps are. And, and, and I think it's fair to say that uh, you've mentioned Montana. In, in, in that part of the country, it is, a, it is a challenge. Now, in other parts of the country, there is uh, there are probably s s uh, significant numbers and fairly convenient opportunities, but uh, in other parts of the country there are serious holes uh, that probably need to be addressed, which is one of the reasons why I asked the question about rural development resources, whether or not we could better use and better target those resources to meet that, that, that opportunity if it was financially feasible to do it. Uh, we have just a few more minutes left in this panel, um, and I think what follows, uh, if I'm not mistaken, John Farrell, is that uh, folks is it pick up lunch and then they come back for, for uh, the opportunity for people to comment. Uh, there will be numbers uh, posted, I think, on the screen, and if your number's there, you just stand in line, and your, your comments will be taken down. We have a reporter here, um, and we appreciate the, the hard work of transcribing something like this uh, uh, so that we have an accurate record. So we'll be, we'll be in the process uh, in just a few minutes of starting that. But I'd like to give everyone uh, just a minute um, to, uh, to summarize uh, and, and put it in this perspective. If we came back here uh, because a good doctor made sure that we were all healthy uh, five years from now, uh, what would you like to see uh, the situation to be? How would the conversation hopefully be uh, either the same or different? Well, we've, we've heard the same for so many years. We're kind of accustomed to that. But uh, I would like to see, definitely, well, we've talked about it, we've got to do something to stimulate some young people to get back into agriculture some way, somehow. We've seen nothing but uh, our numbers decreasing in the livestock industry. We've got to relax some of these restraints on public lands. We've got to help our ranchers with predation. We've, we've brought back the wolf. We've protected the grouse. We've done the, the big horns. And, the consequences of that are uh, diminishing numbers in the livestock industry. And if we don't work on some of that stuff, I don't know that we can bring it back. So I, I hope in, if we do this in five years, if you guys would consider having me back up, there would be a whole lot better picture. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I would like to see the room uh, full. I would like to see the average age in the room be about 40 or 35. And I would like people talking about problems that they're having because we have so many outlets now, so much direct marketing, and we're making so much money, we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I, would, I would like us to, as an agricultural community as a whole, I would like us to be somehow able to communicate to consume, um, consuming America that we really are the environmentalists, that we really are the people that care for the land and the animals. So when, when we come back in five years, we won't be concerned about consolidation because we'll be decentralized. And we won't be concerned about imported foods because the quality does not compete with what we produce. And if we can somehow touch the market, that will work itself out without regulation. So I'd like to see that problem solved in the next five years. In five years, I would echo that I would like to see the young people here also. But I was reading minutes from an affiliate, a cattle affiliate, from 1946. And here in 1946, the minutes were, they were concerned about the average age of the producer. 
They were concerned that producers were getting off farm income. So in five years, what I would really like to see is again that there is that more young people and that we have that true story about the good that we do, not only for our animals and for the safe food supply that we provide to the American people, but that message is clearly communicated and understood outside of just our circles. That we really, truly have that connection with those individuals that, that may not understand how we do things and care for animals. But what also, all of the information that's been presented on the first panel and this one has been good. But what we really need is that in-depth analysis of, the, of all of these changes that are occurring or being talked about and understand the unintended consequences. The proposed rule signifies structural change with very vague language. And what I really want is there not to be that vagueness so that we do have that young person that can has that assuredness that no I'm not going to be taken out because of that ever increasing regulation or because of the constant threat of litigation in the business whether it be from something as simple as the endangered species that's a joke or our own marketplace so again I would echo what everyone has said about the young people, but I want the in-depth analysis and not litigation and intervention that determines and drives our ability for our young people to be in this market. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> along with the a fact of uh, wanting to see more younger people here five years from now, and quite a lot younger. Uh, just picking out some parts of this of uh, the speech I thought I was going to give, <laughs> <laughs> because the the cattle industry is the economic backbone for much of Indian country. The federal government must take steps to prevent the concentrated beef packers and the concentrated cattle feeders from engaging in the practices that are eliminating the economic opportunities for individual Indian operators. We must preserve competition, not just in the market between the cattle feeder and the beef packer, but also in the market where Indian operators sell their calves to backgrounders, stalkers, and feedlots. Competition is what prevents the beef packers from controlling the cattle supply chain like they now control the hog supply chain. And, I mean, that's, that's what we're up against. That's, that's where our problem is. Yep. Well, that's a heck of a wish list I was writing down here. I can just keep writing. And, um, I only got a minute. I only got a minute, the secretary <laughs> tells me. Um, well... Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I'd, I'd love to see the Packers have to go out in the countryside and bed hogs and cattle and whatever else again. So, you know, ban them from owning the critters. That's, that's the first thing. I'd, I'd like to see everybody benefiting out of a restructured system. And I mean everybody, the family farmers, the consumers, and the Packers. They always have made money. They just got a little greedy here. Um I'd like to see the environment benefit. We need a cleaner environment throughout this country. Iowa, unfortunately, is 50 of 50 in water quality. To me, that's an embarrassment for our state. I would like to see rural development working, population stabilizing, beginning farmers wanting to farm. I would like to see the food miles coming down, more localized agriculture. I like to see food safety, uh, better food safety, starting with family farms, again, raising and owning the livestock. And the animal husbandry issues out there. I think every independent producer knows that any independent family farmer takes far better care of them animals than anybody else on this planet. Thank you.
In this country, we value our freedom, I think, as much as anything. And if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that all freedoms we enjoy are protected in some way. There's always an individual, an entity that in their own self-interest will try to extend into the, the freedom of another. So when we want to recognize the freedom of, of individuals to contract or make agreements as they wish, but we also recognize the need for limits when the freedom imposes on the freedom of another people. If, if we will pursue a policy that uh, will halt this trend of concentration of size to just achieve market power, and we can diverse that through our rural communities and pursue a policy that allows the most, the smallest economically efficient unit to survive, we will disperse and keep uh, spread out in our rural economies an active industry uh, that will provide opportunities for our young people. So it's my hope that we will pursue policy that allows those economically efficient units to survive by securing that they've got access to a market. And if we do those things, it will help the survival of our rural economies, the employment of our young people, and the best thing is it won't cost the federal government a dime. I think it's important that you, <coughs> uh, you know, try to focus on some of the things we agree on, and hopefully everybody uh, in this room would raise their hand that we're all meat eaters. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's one of the things you know our industry. Uh, obviously worried about packers and concentration and, and the, the spot market, but what's being forced on us, not only regulations, you know, within the environment, uh, which some of those we do need to deal with, there's no doubt about it, but I mean, the, the groups that are coming at us and telling us we need to raise animals in a certain way is, is probably a, a real concern in, in our organization. Well, there's one common theme in this group, you know, and that is the thing we all want young people back involved. You know, somehow we have to turn the rural around. I have just one little perspective. I think that camera's pretty good. But there's our two youngest kids are actually adopted. I don't know if that shows up on there or not. But, but anyway, we adopted them from Haiti. And, and uh, so the, the underlying freedoms that we still have in this country, you know, are enormous. Uh, that I've spent time down there. Uh, different times and the restrictions they have uh, you know their their best day is you know is not good you know it, it, it's a real challenge so we've got some real positives on here and hopefully we can all work together and focus on things that will improve and help each one of the industries and also look at each individual industry because we are we are diverse so you want I think the one thing that's worth saying is what was said at the outset, and we're only halfway through the day. The amount of learning and getting experience on people who are on the ground is invaluable. And the aim here is this is not the end of a process. It's really the start of an ongoing process to make sure we're getting from you all your perspectives, your ideas. And even if you know, someone like Harry doesn't know all the dynamics at work. That's our job to take that information and make sense of it. So thank you for helping to, us, to enable us to do our jobs better. Um, I want to I want to thank the panel, and I, I want to take uh, uh, I guess a personal privilege for just uh, uh, two minutes uh, uh, to speak about what I've heard and, and what I've heard uh, as I've traveled to virtually every state in this country. Um, there really is something at stake here, uh, more than what we've talked about today, which is the livelihood of uh, good, hardworking producers, uh, and more than uh, the capacity of rural, develop, uh, rural economies uh, to survive and small towns to thrive. Uh, it is really, as Governor Ritter suggested, about the value system of this country. As I travel around the country, I try to tell our urban and suburban friends something about rural America, and the best statistic I give them is the following. One-sixth of America's population lives in rural America. About 40 percent of the men and women in uniform come from rural America. Um, so 40 percent of those 100,000 troops that are coming back from Iraq probably live in small towns, probably grew up on a ranch or a farm. Forty percent of those 130,000 young men and women that risk their lives in Afghanistan from those small towns, those farms, and those ranches. Now, why is that? 
Now, some would suggest that the reason is because they uh, seek opportunity through the military uh, for a better life. And that may be part of it. But I think there's something more at work here, uh, and that is how young people are raised in rural communities across this country. They are raised with a very simple set of values. Hard work is its own reward. Uh, you are responsible for your actions. And they also understand something about Mother Nature which is that you can't keep taking from the land. You have to give something back. You've got to replenish it from time to time. And when you do, Mother Nature will reward you with good and bountiful crops. Country's no different. You can't keep taking from it. And periodically, you have to give something back. These kids understand that because you all have taught them that. So as I travel around this country talking about the importance of farming and, and ranching, I go beyond the food supply the fact that you're responsible for 85% of the drinking water in this country, the fact that you're also helping to clean the environment and the air through carbon sequestration, what you all do in, the, in, in your fields. I, I talk more about this set of values. To me, what USDA ought to be about, and hopefully it is about, and under my leadership we're looking to make sure it's about, expanding export markets, creating more domestic opportunities, and having more local consumption and production being linked. Uh, making sure that we do pay attention to food safety because that does and can impact markets and certainly the innocent get hit very, very hard when there is a food safety incident. Uh, making sure that we use our rural development tools in a way that will help build up those local market opportunities and create the off-farm income that many farm families still need today and in the foreseeable future will likely have to have. Uh, that is part of the work of USDA. These hearings uh, are also part of our work, which is to ask tough questions, to, to, uh, to stimulate important and significant debate on how markets are functioning, who's benefiting and who's not, and why, so that we can do a better job of making sure that that value system that I talked about remains alive and well. I think it's at the core of this country. I think rural America is the soul of this country, and it is worth preserving and fighting for and worth making the difficult decisions that will have to be made uh, in order to do the very best job. So I want to express my appreciation to all who are here today because you all care deeply, not just about your own operations, but your community and about rural America. And that says a lot, and hopefully the rest of the country is paying attention. Thank you all.